are needed. All right. Good evening, everybody, my fellow commissioners. I'd like to call to order the Bloomington Historic Preservation Commission teleconference meeting for Thursday, August 13th, 2020 at 5 p.m. So uh, can we get a call to order? Roll call. And Dee Willis is with us. She's taken Eddie's place. Uh, Dee, could you please unmute your mic? All right. There you go. Okay. Doug Bruce? No. Sam DeSoller? Susan Dyer? Jeff Golden? Here. Deb Hutton? Here. Lee Sandwise? Here. John Sanders? Here. Saunders? Sorry. Here. Chris Sturbaum? Here. Duncan Campbell? Here. Ernesto Castaneda? Derek Ritchie? Jenny Southern? Here. And Sam is here. He just joined. Hey, I'm in all of them. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Um, I need approval for minutes. So moved. Second. Who seconded that? I did, Lee. Lee. Thank you, Lee. Sure. Why don't I see that? All right. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. No. Okay. Uh, Doug Bruce. Nope. Nope. Sorry. Sam Desoller. Yes. Susan Dyer. Nope. She's not here. Sorry. Jeff Golden. Here. Is that a yes? Yes. Okay. Deb Hutton. Yes. Here. Lee Sandwise. Abstain. John Saunders? Yes. Chris Sturbaum? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, so vote carries. Motion carries. Four, zero, one. Thank you, Dean. You're welcome. All right, Connor, um, let's move on to certificate of appropriateness, appropriateness, staff review, COA 2026. Yeah, this was uh, just a, a request for a fence in Greater Prospect Hill. It was a four foot fence around the northeast corner of the property and went up to six and a half feet on the southwest corner. Uh, fence will be cedar, wood panels, pressure treated posts, stainless steel cable on the four foot section. It's going to look like this. Um, so, staff approved. The fence meets UDO standards for height and material. The fence will not block or obscure view of the house from the public right away. Uh, this is another staff uh, approval, COA 2030. This is in the Elm Heights Historic District, uh, 1003 East Hunter. Um, the request was to remove uh, an existing deck um, and add a new ramp and a partially new deck to provide accessibility for the owner. Um, the deck and ramp will be wood stained to match existing. Um, the flooring will be composite decking. It'll have uh, two by two spindles for guardrails. Uh, so the deck is self-supporting. I went out there, took a look. Um, it won't anchor into the brick wall. And then the location of the deck is preferable, uh, which is on the side of the building, not the street facing facade. So the location, the materials, and the fact that it's self-supporting, um, you know, I, I gave the staff approval on that and met the guidelines expectations. Terrific. Thank you, Connor. All right, let's move on to COA 20-27, 219 South Maple Street. Uh, Chris Turbaum is the petitioner. Okay, Connor. All right, so uh, I'm going to do a, my staff report and then uh, we're going to do a round of questions. And after the round of questions, I'm going to kick Chris out of the meeting. Um, Chris, what you need to do is just ask to join the meeting again. You'll sit in the waiting room. And then when we go to, uh, we finish voting, then I'll, I'll bring you back in. So you'll essentially be out for the comments. 
and you'll be out for the vote and then I'll let you back in. So I just wanted to let you know, that's how we're gonna do uh, you know, these requests uh, when commissioners are involved. Um, Makes sense. Okay. So this is in the Greater Prospect Hill Storage District. The request is to add a, onto an existing one-story addition. You, can, you can't even see the addition uh, from South Maple as it is uh, in this photograph, but this is it here. Um, the siding will be four inch lap to match the house. The roof will be flat. Um, the additional story adds a total of nine feet to the height of the rear addition. And you can see um, how it's gonna tie into the existing pyramid roof. There's a few better drawings I just got today from Chris here um, that show it. Um, looking at the uh, guidelines for Greater Prospect Hill on additions, I hope the commissioners had a time to review those. Uh, it says that the use of materials currently on the existing structure should be continued or can be continued onto the addition that's happening here. Uh, excessive impact to the public way facade should be discouraged um, and increased design flexibility for additions on non-public way facades may be considered. Uh, so staff would recommend approval of COA 2029 with the following comments. The siding material and architectural detail are compatible with the primary structure. The added height is concerning, but because the rear addition will have a flat roof that fills into the hip roof uh, and does not extend above it, uh, and the side yard setbacks on the house, and you can see that if you want, are, are, are pretty small, so it's kind of crowded from either side of it. Um, the, 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 the addition will hardly be visible from South Maple. Um, however, it will be highly visible from the alleyway that runs behind it. Although I do want to note that the Greater Prospect Hill design guidelines distinctly say that alleyways should not be considered public right-of-way facade for these purposes. Um, so staff finds that the project meets all three of the guidelines standards for additions and recommends approval. All right, Jeff, do you have questions? I don't have a question, but I just want to add that the people that weighed in from the design uh, subcommittee all uh, were in favor. Thank you, Jeff. All right, Deb, do you have questions? Uh, I guess my only question is um, at the back end, I don't know what off the alley, how much space is there between the end of the addition and the edge of the garage? Uh, yeah. It should be here in site, the site plan. Uh, oh, there, so it's about 25 feet, half the space. Looks like. Okay. Thank you, Deb. Thank you. Lee, do you have any questions? I don't. No, thank you. Uh, Sam. Hey, uh, Chris, can you describe the, the cornice uh, and how the drainage works on that roof, the flat bit? It'll be surround, it'll have a gutter on all sides of that flat roof. And we'll have slope, subtle slope, so that it drains all, all, all directions. So it's basically like a teeny hip roof with uh, gutters on all sides. And then you've got like a one by 12 or something uh, behind the gutter. Probably it'll be by about, our projection might be seven and a half at the most on that fascia behind the gutter so that it sim it's similar to the rest of the house. It just has a little overhang all around. You may not be able to see the overhang, but we'll have overhang and gutter. Thank you. And, and Chris, the uh, back porch there, uh, how I, tall is that again, nine feet? Could you say that again, please? The back, the back, new back porch. Right. And they, that's gonna have a nine foot ceiling Really, the ceilings are, they're going to be lower than we talked about. Uh, they're probably going to be a little, at least six inches lower than that on the top of them. Okay. But it's, uh, it's simply doubling what's below it. Like all that below it exists. And this is just a stack on top of the box. All right. Thank you, Chris. Sure. Chris, I got one more question on that image that's just come up. There's some kind of white 
shed looking thing on the right in the middle there that what's that thing it's an existing storage shed gotcha it just doesn't show up in the site plan so i was wondering if it Something was like, like that yeah okay thank you thanks Can yeah. i ask another question sure uh chris uh where the new hip roof touch uh seems to join with the um current roof do they touch do they actually just, I suppose there's a wall that goes through with the door and stuff, but what about the roof, roof line? Do they actually, the two, the brand new roof and the old roof or the old wall, how do they um, touch? Yeah, they connect. How? Um, that top, that top little flat area comes up and hits the top ridge of the pyramid. But literally just like that, touching? Right there. You'll see the front edge. Oh, yeah. yeah right that, this is in play a little bit. It looks like we're going to go under the other roof just barely so the gutter can go clear around. Okay. And so that we drop the connector and minimize that mass. So the roof line, roofs, the old and the new, or existing and new, are not actually joined they'll be literally mated or just one below the other? That diagonal line used to be the old hip. And that's going to go straight across. That line will disappear. We'll go straight into the addition Oh. in the same plane. OK. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Deb. Uh, Duncan? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, why did you decide to put a flat roof on it? To minimize the the set the size of it. You mean from the street or from the street? You won't. You almost do not see it. And if I had a a low pitched roof because of the angle looking up, you still might not see it. Yeah, that's what you I was thinking. We didn't want something looming over the structure. Right. And it's, it sort of shrinks it down this way. And like from the street, it'll you'll have to look to see it from both sides from Maple. You'll have to try pretty hard. Well, I, I guess, OK, well, I guess that answers my question. I'll, I'll save the rest for comments. Sure. All right, thank you. Um, any more questions? Any questions from the public? Okay, Chris, I'm going to put you in the waiting room. Okay. All right, thanks, Chris. Waiting room? Yep. All right. Comments. Comments. Uh, Jeff. Um, it looks fine to me, and since the neighborhood is uh, good with it, I'm good with it. Thank you, Jeff. Deb? Uh, I think this flat roof in the back is sort of odd with the other angles in the roof, but if the neighborhood is fine with it, and I can see how if you added roof, you'd add that to get space in the room, you'd need, you know, more volume. So I'm okay with it. All right. Thank you, Deb. Lee? Yeah, it was well thought out, and I'm, I'm fine with it. Great. Thank you. Sam? Uh, I think I think the form, especially the roof form, is kind of awkward, um, and I, it 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 bothers me because it doesn't. I mean, it's very clearly a, a an addition which kind of works, but it's uh, and the scale of it is fine, and I understand that Chris is trying to minimize the scale of it, but I'm always one who likes to try to match the the roof slope and have an addition. Uh, a little more harmonious with the the, the building itself, but um, given that the the neighborhood doesn't have an issue with it, I um, I, I don't have enough of an issue with it to uh, uh, naysay it. Okay, thank you, Sam. Uh, Duncan. Okay, you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, when you're evaluating compatibility, one of the things that is one of the more crucial elements is the roof. 
And I find that very incompatible. And I don't really understand his explanation about why you couldn't use a low gable because it's going to come back and intersect the back of the original house at the hip in the same basic location. It's going to be a little higher, but it's not going to be any more visible. It might be a little more visible from the side, but I think that that looks like a Florida house addition to me. It, it, it just makes the whole, I don't mind going off the back of the house. I just think the roof misaligns the compatibility. You know, it's, I would, I would, I would rather see a, a low pitch plus flat roofs are a disaster to maintain. But, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I get that it's not a, really obtrusive, but I I think it's, it really alters the look of the house radically. And I don't think it would if it were just a low pitch gable roof. So and what you're saying, Duncan, is that, is that uh, the pitch of that roof would actually change the interior of the upstairs. Am I getting that right? No, I don't think it would change the interior. The ceiling would be in the same place. So you're just, oh, so talking you're, about putting like a three and twelve or something up there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Or maybe, or maybe I don't know how high the interior wall is. If it's nine feet, take it to eight. I don't know, but but if you had a low pitch roof, you could come right into the back of the original hip. You wouldn't have that flat corridor extension, and you'd still be below the the main ridge on the hip. So it wouldn't be any more visible, except from the side it might be, but you're going to see that as a flat roof from all sides. It's not like it's, it's not like you're not going to see it. Mm -hmm. I'd rather see it as a gable, which mm -hmm. is what, which would be much more compatible to the design of the, of the original house. Right. So it looks like that, that's just been stuck on. Somebody drove to Fort Lauderdale and bought it and brought it up and stuck it on the back of the house. That's, I mean, I just, I think that's a design error. And when you're trying to get things to be compatible, you want them to be as, as unobtrusive as you can. If he had a two story, three story addition stuck way up above the house, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go for it. But I don't think it's going to show, or it's going to show very little. And we've approved some that stick up even higher. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my, that's my thought. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah, but well, I, I mean, further with, to just what you just said, it, it's maintenance. The flat roof is a nightmare. But this is what the underbear requires. Yeah. Yeah, getting them to drain and keeping the leaves off of them and all the rest of it. God, I know I've experienced it. Okay, Duncan. Um, do we have any more comments? I, I would just say that we might uh, ask if Chris is willing to put. Uh, a gable roof on a low slow gable roof on all the flat portions and uh, maintain all the ceiling heights and whatnot um, because I, I, I agree with Duncan in that it's not going to add a uh, street presence to put a gable roof on it and it's going to be less of a maintenance item if you you know punch out like a 12 or whatever overhang and then a 3 and 12 either gable or hip roof on that thing, it's going to look a lot more like it belongs to that house. Okay. Can uh, I add my comment, another comment, Jeff? Yes, please, Jeff. And that, John, that would just be that uh, going along with the uh, other comments, I agree completely that the flat roof looks awful. Um, if I went along with the neighborhoods like it, well, okay, but if there is a choice or a way of persuading Chris to add a, even a slight roof, uh, gable roof, uh, that would improve it immensely. Okay, so, um, okay, uh, yeah, I just, you know, looking at the, the design guidelines, you know, with, with this, you know, when, when you guys make a motion to approve or deny something, I really want to start encouraging you guys to base your motion off of, you know, uh, guidelines, whether that be Secretary of Interior Standards or the local design guidelines. So, um, you know, my understanding of what the language in the guidelines is that you know this is a project as it stands um you know could be approved excessive impact to the public facade should be discouraged i think i heard you know duncan say several times that you know you can't see it either way um or it's, it'll be hard to see with the flat roof uh it'll be impossible to see with the flat roof and and hard to see with the with the hip roof 
So if it's not impacting the public right away, you know, in its current form, you know, I don't feel like this could easy, this should be denied. Um, however, you know, I think it's fair to ask Chris if he would be willing to, you know, change it to a hipped roof. Um, but I just, I just wanted to throw that out there. I, I totally agree with you. I, I, I don't think I want, I'm, I'm in the space to deny this. I'm just saying that it would be better with some kind of sloped roof. And if we can leave that option open for him in our motion uh, and, and sort of encourage that, um, I think that that would be preferable. Yeah, this, I, I, this is Duncan again. I, I, I agree with that. I, you know, uh, Connor, I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I want to say two things. Guidelines are exactly that. They're guidelines for the commission. They're not hard and fast rules. And we always try to improve what we're being offered if we can. And I think this would just be an improvement. I, you know, I, I agree. I'm not a voting member, but I wouldn't vote against it. But I, but, but, you know, it's our business to make these things better. And compatibility is a huge issue. And it's one that we need to pay a lot of attention to. Good point, Duncan. And, and I think that Chris <clears throat> knows enough that he would probably go along with this. Well, maybe, maybe so not. I, I agree that he should. We should ask him, you know, and tell him that we. I, 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 my sense of the meeting, right from just my seat here, is that most people, more or less, agreed with what I was saying. So, if that's if that's the feeling, it may not be a rationale for denial. But you know, if if he if he designed a flat roof because he was worried about it being obtrusive, and he can build. A better roof that's not a that's also not obtrusive. Why wouldn't he choose to do it? I mean, he's you know he's trying to keep it invisible, but he's created something that, in its own right, is visible in a, I think a negative way. So, you know, it's a it's a you know six of one and half dozen of another in terms of approval. But let's let's approve the best thing we can get. Okay. Um, so Sam, do you want to make a motion? Uh, can I have a comment before we do? You absolutely. Okay, um, I agree with several of the comments of people and I'm really concerned about um, the, the middle part there where the, it looks like there's two flat roofs coming together. I can't see where it's snow and ice that that would be a good thing for the original structure. Um, I think that's gonna be a real problem um, for water infiltration. Yeah, like right in the middle there. Um, where the where the old part hits the new, is that a flat little flat roof hitting a large flat roof? Yes. Going to tuck it under. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry. I don't know if that will make any previous clear. picture maybe. <laughs> this is a, another example of a drawing he gave me. He's talking about where he's filling it in here. Maybe that's not as clear. I just got these today, um, and Chris seemed to. Yeah, he's a little surprised at the product. Like maybe this is, he said it was fluid. So maybe what we talked about is a little different than what I'm seeing in this picture here today. I don't know. Yeah, I, the, the roof closest to us, the tilted roof, uh, that one looks like it, he said, I think he said that's gonna run together. On the other side of it though, that looks like a flat piece at that peak. Mm -hmm. Said he was gonna like cut under the other thing. Because I don't see a corner sticking up there like I we have on the addition over here. So it looks like that's a flat roof. So you're, you've got two flat roofs coming together there. And he said but, he got her all the way around. I, I agree, Jenny, but you know, it's it's not in our purview yeah. to change that. It's, it's in our purview to give them recommendations and if right. there's a dozen problems. Well, I was just throwing out a concern for the original structure, not really. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that is flat, yeah. Jenny. I mean, it could just be a, a visual thing. It could slope down. I don't know if this is straight flat. Mm -hmm. Can we uh, cool. in, invite Chris back and ask him if he's open to that? Sure, we can do that. Absolutely. Hey, Chris. He's joining now. He's not quite here yet. He may have stepped out. It says joining us grayed out, so I don't know. 
Um, it doesn't, uh, the left side of the structure doesn't really bother me because I think since this drops from if uh, on my right to the left, it looks like it drops about four feet by the wall in the front. So the uh, over by the garage is actually higher on the street than over by the left tree. So you're going to see a lot more uh, corner than you, you, you won't see the addition at all. He's talking about from the left side of the property. Is that the west, maybe, where the little shed is? I doubt yeah. you'll see that at all. Sure. The only part you'll really be able to see is right here by the driveway, you're going to get a good shot of that corner and the flat roof there because you're a little bit high as you come down Maple Street. Um, so I won't agree that you won't be able to see that, uh, except for the left side. Um, so. I would like to see something tilted on that side. I, the other side, we won't be able to see, and so I really don't care that much about it, as much about it. <laughs> Thanks. Chris, are you in? <coughs> Bless you. Thank you, Sam. I'm back. All right. Hey, Chris. So we have a couple of questions for you. Okay. Um, Sam, do you want to approach Chris on that? Sure thing. Uh, so we are wondering if you would be willing to consider putting a uh, sloped either gable or hip roof on the back addition. I think uh, the concerns about uh, you know visibility versus incompatibility are leaning towards uh, putting something that's not flat if that's within the scope and budget of your project. So is that something you would be willing to consider? Well, <clears throat> we could consider it, you know, knowing the site and knowing the view shed, we'll just make something stick up that will catch the eye rather than something that very much minimizes what we're doing back there. There are all the lines of sight are low. Maple Street goes downhill. You know, it's very, it's very, difficult to even pick it up. But if we built something taller, I didn't want to overshadow the original structure. I'm also so thinking that, we're, we're also going to make a trap door to let him get up and clean his gutters out <laughs> on that high flat space. I think the concerns that the commission is having, and anybody correct me if, uh, if I'm misspeaking, is that uh, it, it's the addition with a very flat roof uh, is significantly differentiated from the rest of it. And I think the concerns about visibility are uh, less of a less of a concern than the concerns about uh, compatibility, if that makes sense. Well, I can point out that that flat roof is going to be the same height as that little tiny ridge top of the pyramid. It's not like it's sitting down from that. So if we if we built a shallow pitch, yeah, you know, we can do that. You probably won't be able to see the shallow pitch. If I built at a 45 degree angle, we'd have a great big roof way up in the air. Yeah, I think we're thinking more like three-ish and 12-ish. Yeah, I think you won't see it, but it, it could be done very easily. So if you're willing to um, consider that, that would be, I, th I think that's, uh, I think that's the, the direction we're leaning if, if you'd be willing to, willing to consider. I'm considering, I'm asking the commission to consider that you almost won't see it, and if you do see it, it will it will seem to loom over the structure, the existing structure. So I I would do that if I'm if I'm requested to do it. I think the flat is because you can only see it from a helicopter. What you'll see are gutters, and the, your line of sight would you know probably not even pick up a three twelve from most angles. Okay, but I am I am okay with uh, the decision of my compatriots here. Thank you. 
Any more uh, uh, questions? I I, I, got a, I had a question for you, Chris. Good. Sure. Just um, it. I'm just looking at the drawing, so it's the perspective's a little strange because we're looking from above, but it looks like a low pitch gable would still would either come in even with that small ridge on the original house or slightly below it. But you're saying like a 312 pitch might come up above it? The flat part of that roof is almost equal to the ridge on that gable. Oh, so that drawing's not anywhere near accurate. It's a little, it's a little low. I mean, it's showing it <laughs> below it. It's gonna be, well, see that little connector? It's gonna go up here. The connector drops, but the, the, the roof itself is actually higher than a little higher than this drawing shows. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Is that that's my that, original drawing. You can see why I got some more drawings for you. But it looks like it's going to the, the top of the ridge here on the original structure. Yeah. Right. That's Remember that's it's, it's, more realistic. Okay. Well, I was just, I was making the comment that um, it looks kind of like a Florida house or something, you know, and a flat roof is a, is a nuisance to maintain. And, and it just seems less compatible with the original, we have a roof with fairly complex uh, historic roof there with, with hips and, and fairly steep pitches and to put something flat on the back, but seem more, seem less compatible to me than trying to, make a gable work but if a gable won't work then i withdraw all my comments I'm, you know i i just when i see it from my perspective i'm not on the street so i can't all i all i think i could see is that corner sticking out yeah mm -hmm. um and i and that shows me that there's a flat roof there but i i know when you're looking up it's a lot different from when you're looking down and I do have that feeling it just tower, it might tower over the old house a little bit too much. Yeah. So I'm trying to make the invisible addition. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Comments? Should I get out again? No, I think we could probably do a motion. If uh, we have anybody ready, he needs, that again. Be, he needs to be gone for the vote. That's what right. I think too. Yeah, it's kind of awkward though because it's not like he can't still. <laughs> I'm, walking, I'm, I'm, I'm walking to the other room, Chris. I'm going to the kitchen. Okay, thank yeah. you. We'll put you back in the waiting room. <laughs> okay, Chris, you're going to be the waiting room now. Uh, so we need a motion. So I'm going to move to approve COA 20-27 uh, at 219 South Maple Street with the caveat that the uh, applicant has the option to do a 3 and 12 uh, gable or hip roof on the addition with the matching overhang to the existing house. Second. All right. Uh, can we uh, take the uh, motion again? Dee, are you with us? I'm with you. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Sam DeSoller? Yeah. Jeff Golden? Yes. Deb Hutton? Yes. Lee Sandweiss? Yes. John Saunders? Yes. Motion carries four, zero, zero. Perfect. Wait, four? It should be five people. It should be five. It was. It's five. I'm sorry. Okay, it's all right. Are you back with us, Chris? Why is it five? Chris couldn't vote. Oh, well, right. he's, he's out in the kitchen. Right. Right. Three, three, four, five. Okay, never mind. Is he out? Is he out? Yeah, there he is. Mm -hmm. All right, Chris. You're approved. Do you hear me? He just muted. He okay, that's good. All right, let's move on to uh, COA 20 28, uh, 346 South Buckner. And our petitioner is with us. Hi, Chris. I'm back. 
Okay, there you go. All right, so uh, what you're looking at here uh, is not in a local historic district. It's located uh, 307 South Miller Parkway. Um, it is rated as contributing on the Bloomington Historic Sites and Structures list. Uh, so the request is to essentially uh, rebuild this bungalow on a vacant lot, which is 346 South Buckner Street, uh, which is in the Greater Prospect Hill Historic. <coughs> So they're gonna, it's not gonna be a move from what I understand. I think they're gonna uh, take it apart and then you know move it piece by piece and rebuild it onto that vacant lot at 346 South Buckner. And the reason it's vacant is because the HPC approved the demolition of the house that was there last year. Um, so uh, looking at it, uh, the architectural style date of construction of this house um, and the size of the building is similar to other homes in the southwest portion of the Greater Prospect Hill Historic District, and the uh, architectural style is compatible with the historic character of the area to where it's being moved to. So uh, staff would find uh, that you know, tearing this down, rebuilding it uh, in Greater Prospect Hill um, uh, should be approved. And I also want to note that the Neighborhood Design Guideline Committee uh, also approved this. Um, Chris? Yes. Oh, the other Chris. Uh -huh. Chris Marion. Yes. All right, Chris, can you describe to us more what your plans are with this property? With which property? Moving it, moving it from its location to the new location. Well, uh, the, the plans with the structure there? How's it going to work? How are you going to, what's your plans for it? Yeah, uh, it, it'll. I'm going to try to take it apart, kind of in panels, if I can. Uh, it's kind of my hope. Uh, if I can't take it apart in in larger sections, um, then you know I'll, I'll end up disassembling it. Uh, <laughs> the The house is really in nice condition. Uh, I, I've been struggling for a couple of years to to get a sewer connection uh, to this location for various reasons. Um, so uh, the, the the neighborhood where the house is currently is about to change quite a bit, and and so I have this nice lot on Buckner Street, and and it and it seems to me that the the house would fit in the fabric of that neighborhood. Um, so as I said, in in general, I try to take it apart in in larger pieces, um, you know, truck it over in some fashion, and then reassemble it. Uh, basically, the way it is, although. Uh, this house did have an open front porch on it, um, which I'd like to open up uh, just on the left side, which would be the side that faces Smith Street. Um, some of the original stones in the, are still in the backyard that used to hold, hold the roof up there. Uh, so I'll, I'll preserve all that back and open up some of the porch again on it. And I would also like to add that, uh, you know, this house by itself, um, since it's not a historic district, if Chris wanted to demolish it, it would go through a demolition delay, and it would, it would be unlikely since it's just a contributing building that it would be saved or designated. So I, I think it's important to note that the fact that, you know, Chris is willing to take the time and effort to move it um, and save the building, uh, you know, it, it should be taken into consideration as well. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, let's move on to questions. Uh, Chris Sturbaum? Yeah. I assume you've priced moving the house. Uh, I looked into moving this house to another location south of town last year, and uh, the moving company was right around thirty-five thousand, and there were numerous stoplights in the way. I was estimating it probably would have been in the neighborhood of seventy or seventy-five thousand uh, to move it. The issue with the lot on Buckner Street is, you know, Smith Street there is basically a one-lane street. There's really no I mean, there's just not enough room in that neighborhood to, to try to maneuver that house through there. I, I don't believe in one piece. Right. Do you have the same stoplight issues or is this a shorter move? Uh, it's a shorter move. Uh, I think there might be just a couple of stoplights, um, but I think the narrowness of the streets would, would I mean, that, that the house is 26 feet and then it has a, has a two foot bump out on the side. So the the overall width of is 28 feet and I, I just don't i just don't see that fitting down those streets there <laughs> uh-huh just it i just know how challenging taking it apart is going to be so i was 
hoping you had thought through, I would love to try and save all that, take apart, put together, if it, if it makes any sense at all. But, you know, you could, you can always get another free estimate from those guys. Yeah. From somebody, because you might end up saving your saving money, especially if you're lucky on overheads and stuff. But I know it's tricky. But I know it's gonna be hard to take apart and put together too. Yeah, it. Yeah, I I think it the the construction of it is pretty good. That house is it's old. It's thirty six, but it's all dimensional lumber. Um, oh, like so it's maybe, kind of more modern this, than I'm thinking. It's maybe a kit of some kind, even. Yeah, it 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 could very well be. Uh, I think the date on it's around thirty six. Um, right. So uh, and it. it it's been pretty well maintained. I, I, I feel like it, uh, you know, once I get all the plaster out of it, it'll, it'll come, it'll come apart fairly so you well. Won't, you won't be into hardwood studs. It sounds like you'll be into pine. Yeah. Fir. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So well, good luck. A little, a little easier construction to work on in that respect. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Jeff, have you got questions? I do not. Okay. Deb, do you have questions? I do not. Thanks. Lee, do you have questions? There she is down there. Lee? Lee, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I'm yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Do you have any questions for Chris? Knight? No, I, I don't. Okay. Sam, do you have any questions? No question. And Duncan, do you have any questions? No, great idea. I'm all for it. Mm. Same here. Uh, I'm quite uh, quite at ease with uh, Chris doing this project. I met Chris several years ago, and he's he's awesome. And I support this project moving it over there. So um, let's move on to. Con oh, do we have any? The members of the public have any questions? Okay, uh, let's move on to comments. Chris? It's a great idea and it's going to look fantastic. Nice design. Give it new life. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, comments? I agree with that. It's going to be a great project. And Lee? Same, it's great. Sam? I think the only thing that I would say is if you haven't talked to uh, Steve Wyatt at BRI, they've got some resources for house moving that might be worth checking to, you might save some money. But mm -hmm. either way, whether you have to move it piecemeal or you move it uh, as a whole thing, I think it's, uh, it's an, it'll be a great improvement for the neighborhood and a, you'll be saving a great house. Thank you. Thanks. Duncan, any comments? Good luck. <laughs> and, and same for me, Chris. Uh, it's going to be a project. Jeff? All right. We need Jeff. a motion. Oh, wait. I'm sorry, Deb. Uh, I just like to thank the petitioner for um, having such a good idea instead of just automatically demolishing but moving it. It's a great little house. So thanks. Thank well, you. That, that's a good thing about Mr. Valiant is that he, he really likes old properties and tries to take care of them for us. Move to approve COA 20-28. Second, Sam DeSoller. All right, D. Okay, Sam DeSoller. Yes. Jeff Golden. Yes. Deb Hutton. Yes. Lee Sandwise. Yes. Jeff Saunders? Yes. Chris Sturbaum? Yes. Motion carries 600. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on to COA 20-29, 122 West 6th Street. So uh, this is in the Courthouse Square Sword District, known as the Breeden Building. Uh, the request is uh, to mount new signage on the west and south facades. So this would be the south facade 
uh, along 6th and the west facade along college. Um, signage will be five inch thick aluminum sides with channel letters internally lit. Um, the size is proportional to the facade and does not obscure any architectural features. The signage will not be any larger than the previously approved signage that was on the building. Uh, the material aluminum is listed as historically appropriate in the guidelines and internally lit LED signs are not prohibited by the guidelines. Uh, so staff would recommend approval of COA 2029. Okay, is the petitioner with us? Mr. Chublad? I don't think he's with us. Uh, I asked uh, Mr. Trueblood and Eric Harris, uh, who was uh, working on the facade of this building as well, to, to join the meeting. Eric, are you here? Okay, well, we can't take action on a COA if the petitioner or a representative is not present. Okay. Okay. Um, let's move on to COA 20-32. Oops, didn't put this one in the uh, slideshow, but this is uh, pretty, pretty easy. Um, I'll pull it up uh, so you guys can see it. Okay, so this is a single family home located in the McDowell Local Historic District. Uh, the request is for a full demolition of this house here. Um, the guidelines say that the structure is contributing, which this is, if it's in good repairable condition, then a certificate of appropriateness will not generally be given. Uh, so while the fringe of the, uh, the eastern fringe of the McDowell District, the structure does not meet any of the criteria listed in the guidelines for demolition, it is altered, but not significantly. Um, it still retains enough integrity to contribute to the historic character of the district. Um, and it does not appear to be in poor condition, although staff has not been inside or received any uh, structural reports. Uh, but just looking at it, it appears to be in at least much better condition than the house we discovered at the, discussed at the last meeting. Uh, so staff would recommend denial of COA 2032. All right, great, thank you, Connor. Um, Mr. Shreve, are you with us? Yes, sir, I am. Great. Do you have uh, any additional information for us? Um, the house uh, was rented until uh, earlier this year. Um, um, roughly uh, about the time that my, uh, my tenant moved into uh, assisted living, uh, it became uh, a part of the EM district per the UDO when that was adopted. So I have the lot to the immediate north of this house and to the immediate south of this house. In the uh, uh, as-built survey that I included with my, uh, my petition package, you'll see that this house uh, 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 runs slightly over the, uh, the lot line with the parcel, with the, with the lot to the south there. I, 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 I'm not hell-bent on taking the house down. I just, uh, I'm not sure what I can do with, with one house in the middle in an EM district. It's, uh, I suppose, it, I think the accurate description is it would be grandfathered because it's, it's in a district in which now, you know, I couldn't uh, build this house, but what do I, how do I develop the uh, lots to the north and to the south of it? And so my, ambition in taking the structure down is to enable me to come up with something that's going to conform to the, you know, to the development standards of the EM district that it now falls in the center of. It, um, it's, uh, it's not a, it's not an objectionable bungalow, but it's genuinely nothing special. Okay. So that, 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 that's where I'm coming from, folks. All right, thank you, Mr. Uh, Shreve. So
So uh, let's move to questions and uh, let's start with Chris. Chris Durbaum, do you have any questions? Can you unmute? Okay. Yeah, questions. I'd be interested in supporting this if there was a plan to move this to a, a lot to help it become an affordable project. You know, you'd have to spend some money to get it out of there, but you have to spend some money to demolish it. Um, you could work with Bloomington Restorations perhaps, and it looks like a nice little house that's drifted away from the crowd a little bit. And I can see there's gonna be some other development there. So that's my question. Have you looked into that at, at all? I haven't, I haven't uh, uh, obtained estimates to pick up the house and, and move it, Mr. Sturbaum. No. Um, in terms of, you know, I mean, thinking a little, a little bigger picture, <laughs> three lots, what do we want it to be? Uh, I mean, it's in the employment district. I don't think you want it to be developed, you know, into additional single family home sites on either side. But I'd be happy to do that. Right, well, we have a responsibility to the neighborhood and the existing structures. So that was the point of my question. How can we both get what we want? And that's just just a leading question. That's all, thank you. Yep. Keegan, uh, are you with us? Yes. Could you explain to us what the EM is? Sure. So uh, EM is the, uh, it stands for the Employment Zoning District. Um, basically it's a non-residential zoning district. Um, this whole kind of area along the Beeline Trail, what used to be the railroad, uh, down further south to Switchyard Park um, is a zone for employment. Um, and so yeah, this house is grandfathered in, like Mr. Shreve uh, said, and so it's a non-conforming use. There are limitations on you know, expanding we're making additions to non-conforming uses. Um, and so that's kind of, I guess, where this house is at. Now it can continue as a single family residence. Um, but, um, new single family residences wouldn't be permitted um, on those vacant lots adjacent to it. Okay. Um, the um, um, EM designation um, so what would ever, what would be placed on those properties would have to be employment generating property. I mean, like, is it going to have to be offices or storefronts? What, yeah. what, what, cast, what classifies the EM? Or can sure. it be multifamily? Uh, let me check the UDO. I don't believe it can be multifamily either. Um, let me just check real quick. We have uh, in our allowed use table, it kind of goes into more detail, but let me just pull it up. And while he is checking that, I, I will say that, um, you know, we met with a couple who was interested in buying these lots and they were going to try to save this house and use it as an office. And they were gonna build a, like a machine shop to make signs on the lot as well. Um, I haven't heard back from them. I, I guess maybe the offer fell through and now Mr. Shreve is uh, just seeing if he could potentially demolish it. Um, maybe that would make it more enticing to prospective buyers. I don't, I don't know, but I just wanted to note that. And just to follow up on that question. So there, no uh, residential uses are permitted in the employment zoning district. It ranges from you know commercial, retail, offices, um, other sorts of, you know, commercial uses and things of that nature. And, and, you know, sort of like light industrial, light manufacturing is also permitted in the uh, employment zone industry. No mixed use, right? Uh, no, no residential is permitted. So, uh, yeah, I would say no mixed use. This is not a mixed use zoning district, yes. So it sounds like the old commercial zone, like a low density commercial? Yeah, I would say so. Um, okay. it's, yeah. 
Great, thank you, uh, Keegan. Okay, um, Deb, do you have a question? Um, my only question is there a basement in this house or is it a straightforward um, slab with a bungalow on top? Um, it's got a, a, a dirt basement. I, I don't know if that's the technical term, but it's, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's a terribly unfinished basement. Um, and there was a, there was a, another party that was uh, taking a look at it uh, that met with, uh, may have met with Keegan. I'm not sure if you folks met in person, but they never submitted an offer. So I didn't decline their offer. An offer was never made on it. I would just want to note that I had the same question when the surf, when the issue arose to the EM district, I was unfamiliar with it. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't engaged as Bloomington was going through the machinations of adopting the UDO. Uh, but I, you know, I had these three lots with this, with this, uh, with this uh, bungalow in the middle of it. And, uh, I didn't even realize I was in an EM district or what, what that allowed for. Uh, and so, I, I mean, I am simply in a position of, I've, I've got a, a non-conforming use, but it's grandfathered, but I also have these lots on both sides and it's vacant. And I thought, well, if I could take that down, you know, I can try and develop it. I mean, in its entirety, the three, the three lots uh, with, with, in a use that's uh, consistent with what, uh, what the city uh, planning folks wanted to see from an EM district standpoint. Okay, thank you, Mr. Shreve. Yeah, I suspect you'll run into this, you know, I mean, I'm probably not gonna be the first person to try to figure this out. Um, the EM proposition was a, a new one by me. And I just, I, I kind of, when I bought the other two lots, I thought, well, you know, there are some, you know, the houses across the street that have been developed have, have 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 uh, certainly been marketable, and this lot is more than twice that size, as is a lot to the north and to the south of it. And to the extent the city wanted to encourage, uh, you know, single-family housing development along the trail, I, I thought I had something, uh, but I, I don't have what I thought I had as of April. And so, uh, like I said, I taking it down and, and, and having the flexibility to come up with a plan that was going to conform to the district that I now fall within is what brings me before you for consideration this evening. Okay. Thank you. All right, let's move on to questions. Uh, Deb, do you, Deb, do you have any more questions? Okay. Lee? No, I don't have any. Okay, Sam? Does the uh, McDowell Gardens uh, neighborhood have any comments on this one? Uh, no, I, I I haven't been able to get responses from McDowell Gardens when I when I reach out to their contact person. In some you. time. Okay. All right, Sam. Anything else? No, that's my only question. All right, Duncan. No, I don't have a question. All right. Let's move on to comments. Chris? Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing like old buildings in the back, like falling down sheds and barns. Does the, are there cl lots close by? Well, that, that's a house. Are there lots close by where this could be moved into an appropriate zone? And if, if so, I would like it to be investigated and and the possibilities of working with Bloomington Restorations on this, I'd like to see that come to fruition because it's a perfectly good house. By our bylaws, we aren't really supposed to let it go, but I sure get all the circumstances. So I'd like to find a win-win out of this one and maybe come back with the, after investigating the possibilities of saving the house so we can feel good about opening up that property for, for the intent it's now uh, going to live, live in. That's all. Thank you, Chris. And uh, Jeff? I'm very conflicted. I, I get the position he's in, and I, I hate to lose this house. Thank you, Jeff. Deb? I agree completely with uh, Chris and Jeff. Okay. Lee? I, it's all been said, yes. I, I think that we should it should be explored that the house could be moved. And I understand that the position that the 
uh, petitioners in. It's um, bad timing. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Uh, Duncan? Yeah, this, this imposition of EM zoning, it wasn't actually a rezone motion in April. It's a, it was a map change. Um, and I don't want to accuse anybody in planning have, for having sneaking sneak this by us, but it was a very, it was not a very fine grained process. So lots of properties, including my own, were were changed from their existing zoning, uh, which oftentimes was a different. Like in my case, my property was zoned quarry because the historic use was quarry even though there had been a residence on it for almost 200 years. And uh, when I brought it up, when I wanted to put an addition on my house, I was told that I couldn't enlarge my use because it was non-conforming and grandfathered. And so I was, I am in the process of rezoning to residential estate, which is what it should have been, what should have been done in the first place. So unfortunately for Mr. Shreve and others, the, they've sort of been caught between a rock and a hard place because nobody actually, I don't want to say nobody, and I'm not accusing anybody, but, but there, it, it was, the, when I asked planning about this, they, they said they acknowledged that it was not a quote, fine grained map change, meaning that it basically just skipped over whole areas and didn't look at each lot, it looked at general areas and tried to encourage employment, the development of employment and employment um, opportunity. And I, I think it's frankly a shame they did that along the trail where this residential de uh, uh, development has been so successful. Um, I just feel like it was a very ill considered, the EM was a very ill considered thing. So I, I definitely have sympathy with the issue, but it's in a historic district. I'm definitely against tearing down buildings in historic districts regardless of planning's oversights. And um, I think in this case, moving is definitely is something that, that he ought to look into. Um, but if, 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 the, if he thinks his only option is to tear it down, I, I, I don't think he's right. And I, I don't think it's very likely that we're gonna let him do it. So, uh, you know, I think moving, moving uh, hell, even if you moved it one lot over and you had two lots joining, you'd be better off. <laughs> the fact that it's in the middle is the, what makes it so awkward and, and unfortunate, really. Um, and I don't know if you've talked to planning about this particular dilemma. I had quite a go around with them in the case of my house, but um, they were pretty sympathetic when I talked to them. So um, I don't know if that would do any good or not, but I think there are some alternatives to demolition. So Keegan, if, if, if you were to move it, say to the north lot or to the, to the south, um, could that house still be used uh, as, could that still be residential or would that then change and have to be used uh, as an EM? Yeah, probably if he moved it, it would lose its grandfather's That's status. That's what I thought, but I was asking Keegan. But I mean, I, I worked I worked with planning on my own in my own case because it had some awkwardness to it. I, I'll give you as an example. I wanted to put an addition on my house, which was what started it all in the first place. I own all the adjacent property, but my addition was for a residential estate. My addition was supposed to be 40 feet away from the nearest property line. Well, I own the lot right behind it, but then my addition is only 20 feet away from it. But they, you know, they've they've accommodated me by, by, by providing, offering to provide a variance for that outstanding situation. So I think that they have been, in my case anyway, I don't want to generalize, they were very understanding about the dilemma they put me in by their own oversight. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, there may be some options there if he, if he I mean, I, it seems silly to move at one lot and maybe that's not what Shreve wants to do at all, but, but it, it does, help solve the problem. Could I jump in? Yes, Chris. Is, is this on the very end of a, of a zone or is it in the middle of that new zone? Because is rezoning that area that's obviously right for residential, um, is that even a possibility or is it just a big spot right in the middle of this new commercial zone? Jigen, can you address that? Sure thing. Um, 
Could I share my screen, or is that a possibility? Yeah. yeah. Hold on. Let me, let me get it going. Okay. 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 All right, Keegan, try it. Okay. Let me. So I just wanted to share my screen. Can everybody see this? Yeah. So this is the zoning map. Uh, basically, I'm on Elevate right now. Um, the 916 South Morton properties here. And this is the, so I guess I'll just start by saying that the, the EM zoning district came from um, a name change in the new code. Um, and in the old code, it was called IG, Industrial General. And so now it's EM, and that's just the carryover. If the, in theory, if this house was moved to, you know, a residential zoning district, it would be permitted um, there. You can see just um, to the west, it is zoned R3, um, which is the single family zoning district. Um, yeah, this, um, you know, employment zoning district, it kind of ends on Dodge Street and goes further south, um, you know, through the, to the Switchyard Park. Um, I'm not sure if I addressed all of the questions there. Would you zoom out a no. little bit to show what's just north of Dodds as well? Sure. Sorry, it's a little slow. And I think I see a blank lot or two right adjacent. Behind it. And behind that, yeah. Hard to tell. Chris, I don't think there's any vacant lots in Madison. None? I don't think so. Okay. So Keegan, so Keegan, would you would you talk about where the um, uh, the uh, employment changes to residential multifamily? Is that just like just north of Dodd? Yeah, it looks like um, just to the north of Dodds. There's you know kind of the residential multifamily. Um, then the downtown zoning district also kind of begins. Um, just north of Dodds there. So, uh, Keegan, because the house is divided on, on both sides of that lung, could they not just go ahead and grandfather if he moved it just enough? I mean, the house oh. is battling the two lots. Mm -hmm. Grandfathered in. Mm -hmm. So, what if you were to move the house completely on the next lot? I mean, that's still the same zoning. It's still the same zoning, but the house may still be grandfathered because it's basically down the middle of the house, the two lots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so um, is that something that, that can be worked out? I don't want to say, you know, 100% yes or no. I may want to, you know, run that by uh, Jackie Scanlon, the uh, development services manager, um, to know for sure. I mean, my first thought would be, um, you know, there are limitations to, you know, changes that can be made to non-conforming structures. So I'd be worried that, you know, there would be an issue with taking a non-conforming, even if it's just moving it over, you know, a few feet, you know, the strictest interpretation of the code may discourage us from doing that. But again, I, you know, I'm not 100% sure on that. So I may want to run that by uh, the rest of the team. But that's just my initial thought. Hmm. I have a comment that yeah. might help. You actually have, if you have the lot uh, to the north and south, you actually have four lots there. I see a division that goes north-south through the center of that far lot. Uh, you also have an alley. So if you took it over to the other side of the alley, you could still build over there if you have a second lot. You can ask Keegan about it. But uh, this is the exact sort of thing that would go before the BZA for a variance, I would think. And I think we could safely say that, uh, but we can ask to poll the commission, but uh, that we would support a variance since this is in a historic district to shift the house uh, if he wanted to go for a variance. I agree. Yeah. Any more comments? Jeff? Sam? No further comment. I, I think this is a really funky neighborhood. Um, I think this is a, I mean, this was also a conservation district that was elevated. Is that yeah, true? Yeah, that's right. So I, I, I think 
you know, uh, I, I tend to touch things a little more lightly when I'm dealing with a conservation district that was uh, elevated to a, a, an historic district, uh, especially involuntarily because of uh, statewide le uh, legislation. Um, everything to the south is, it, it's like car shops, it's incredibly industrial, um, you know, full disclosure, I have a lot that is just north of Dodds and I am very sympathetic to the owner on what the UDO has done to what you're able to do and not do in, uh, you know, various zoning districts. But um, it's, it's, it's a neighborhood that is very different on one side of the B line than on the other side of the B line. And it's much less residential on the western end, on the western side of the B line than it is on the eastern side, especially south of Dodds. So, I mean, there's that crazy red house that's just been totally renovated just to the north of this. Uh, and I think you all are familiar with that, but um, I, I would encourage, you know, I, I would totally support moving this house, but I also have a lot of sympathy with the owner in, uh, you know, where they are and what they want to do and, you know, uh, having three lots in a row to make some much larger impact on that neighborhood. So um, I don't think I would necessarily stand in the way of uh, taking this down, but uh, I would really encourage them to move it if at all possible. Okay, any more comments? I agree with Sam's position. I, I would like to see it come back with with some investigation, some reality based. We can, we can't do it on it on trying to find another place for that house. And then I think we'd be ready. You know, if it, if we can't, we can't. Okay. Um, so we need a motion. I move to continue this to the next meeting. Mr. Shreve, is that okay with you? Uh, yeah, so uh, if, if I may, um, my, my understanding of the conversation to this point is that uh, uh, Mr. Sturbaum and others would like me to find, uh, to buy another uh, conforming lot and, and relocate the house to it. Um, or donate it, you know, with, with some supplement, with the cost of demolition and such. I mean, that's one of the ways that people get those houses moved. Or, or give it away. All right. Um, I, I think some of you are sympathetic to the position that I'm in, which isn't one of my making. Uh, it's just where I am. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I wish I had this figured out. Um, so if a, if, it's a, if a continuance is, uh, if we want to punt, uh, I mean, you folks are in charge. I've just tried to explain to you where I am coming from and what brings me before you today. I, I didn't even know what Neom District was, despite having lived in Bloomington since I came to go to school here. Um, I mean, this was really a new one by me, and I, I hadn't imagined that I had a, a house in the middle of this this kind of new district that was non-conforming. And, and I really thought that, you know, single-family housing would be desirable along the trail. I mean, just anecdotally, I thought that City and planning was going to be supportive of, of more of that uh, continuance. If that's your, you know, if that's your preference, I'm obviously, uh, you know. I... So, Mr. Shreve, let me ask you: Are you are you interested in doing that? You know, no one's forcing you to continue this. Um, you can we can just deny it, and you can figure out where to go next, um, or you know, you can ask around and see if you can get this moved somewhere, but no one's forcing you to. So I just want to ask if you're interested in doing that. Cause if you're not, oh, we'll continue. Yeah, I appreciate the clarification. Uh, well, I've never moved a house. I, I mean, your, your, your last uh, petitioner or the one before that has had some experience with that. I just, I, I just, folks, I just have no idea what would be involved. Um, but if uh, a continuance kind of keeps it casually alive uh, for conversation's sake, then, I guess that's better than you, you, you're telling me I need to move it. 
uh, somewhere else. So then I got to ask the commission, what's their expectations for this by continuing it? I could answer since I made the motion. I would like to see a petitioner speak with Bloomington Restorations and see if they're interested in, in a move and examine if there are properties nearby where someone else might be interested in, in taking the house. Just a little bit of investigation of the reality of that option. And I'll, and I'll, this is Duncan. And also talking to planning, I mean, we just heard from the planner uh, that with some maybe more authoritative consultation, they could see what planning would really be willing to let him do here. I don't think that's been fully explored by any means. Um, so uh, I, I, think, I think everybody here is trying to say, we're probably not going to let you demolish this house, but we're not we're not against doing something to get it out of your way. So if, if that could be investigated in time for the next meeting or the one after, then I, I think it'd be worth your while. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor from Chris Sturbaum. I need I'll a second. second. Deb Hutton will second. All right. Dee? Okay. Sam DeSaller? Oh, sure. Jeff Golden? Yes. Deb Hutton? Yes. Lee Sandwise? Yes. John Saunders? Yes. Chris Sturbaum? Yes. Motion carries 600. Thanks for your patience with us, Mr. Shreve. Oh, you're welcome. Good to work with you folks. Yes. And then we'll work hard to try and help you out on this. Thank you. All right. I appreciate it. You have a good evening now. Mm -hmm. Likewise. Thank you. Quick comment to Keegan. Would, would you please work with him on options? Yeah, of course. Of course. Absolutely. All right. Keegan, Thanks. Keegan and I will work on this, uh, you know, next week and next couple of weeks and see what we can come up with, see oh, Mr. Shreve's best options are. But and, and I'll put you in contact with BRI, uh, Mr. Shreve. So. All right. Yeah, thank you. Because I have no, I don't have any relationships there. I, I'm unfamiliar with the workings of BRI. So thank you. Yep. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right, so we're going to move on to uh, demolition delay 20 17, 424 and a half South Walnut Street. So this is uh, the Players Pub building, or it was. Um, the request is for a full demolition. The petitioner is Josh Alley, not Matt Ellenwood. I'd like to clarify that. Uh, I believe in my staff report I had Matt Ellenwood as the petitioner. He is just the architect who's been hired to consult on the project. Bye, Mr. Alley. Um, so this is a, a contributing building. Um, I had some time to kind of dig in a little bit on the history of the building. Um, and what I found was that it, it may have potential for designation uh, based on criteria 1A, which is significant character or interest or value as part of the development heritage or characteristic of the city. Um, or associated with a person who played a significant role in local, state, or national history. And I say that for its association with Henry Boxman and Boxman's Restaurant. Um, so it was Boxman's from about 19, so first of all, the building was built I, about 1925 or 1926. Uh, the M does stand for Mitchell, Mitchell Brothers built the, this building. Uh, it was originally the Dew Drop Inn uh, for a couple of years, but then it was uh, bought out by, and the Dew Drop Inn was a local eatery as a high school hangout, because if you guys know, the high school is located uh, just south of there, um, you, know, you know, maybe not even a block away. So um, in 1928, Henry Boxman moved to town, uh, and he bought uh, the Dew Drop Inn and operated it um, as Boxman's restaurant. And... Um, it was a really successful restaurant until about 1957 when he gave it up. Um, and then he came back in 19, there's it, 1951. Um, he came back in 1960s and opened a KFC, this building here, which is now Coffee Real Estate. Yeah. Um, the Boston's actually lived at this house here, which is 434 South Walnut. And it's funny, I was digging into the archives today and, and reading some stories and he, they had this building built essentially on their front lawn. <laughs> Boxman wasn't very happy about it. 
Um, but she didn't get her way. So he, he got back in the restaurant business. He built this as a KFC. He was a uh, personal friend with Harlan Sanders, the, the, the Colonel. Um, and they had met each other through uh, the American Restaurant Association because um, Mr. Boxman was uh, you know, very active in the uh, Indiana Restaurant Association as well as the National Restaurant Association. Um, a couple cool firsts about this building is it had the first neon sign in Bloomington. Um, I was reading a newspaper article about it, and when they lit it up at night, people thought there was a fire, and they you know, all came out to, to take a look at it, wondering what all that light was. Um, it was the second building in Bloomington to get, uh, like, commercial, commercial building to get air conditioning and heating systems as well. Um, it was also introduced uh, when Foxman bought it in 1928. He had curbside service, which was the first of its kind, and they operated that for a few years until one that became so busy, busy it was no longer practical. Practical. So um, I just find a lot of really interesting things uh, about Boxman's and he was, sent, the more I read about it, you know, he was president of the Chamber of Commerce for a while. He apparently came up with the slogan, uh, Welcome to Bloomington, the gateway to scenic Southern Indiana. Um, so uh, for those reasons, I, you know, I, I feel like it could really meet the historic criteria 1A there. Um, also, uh, the architectural criteria 2F, owing to its unique location or physical characteristics, it's an established or familiar visual pattern, um, and I really think that it is. It's been here for, for so long. It, it, it's, you know, really maintained that, and uh, staff recommendation is to hold the demo delay at least until further research and discussion can uncover the significance of the building, um, and I just want to remind the HPC they have 90 days from the date that I received a demo permit. Um, I received a demo permit July 29th, so July, August, September, October 29th is, is when we have to take action, either to place it under interim protection or to release a demo delay. But I would recommend holding it until we can find out some more information. Okay, Mr. Alley, are you with us? Josh, are you with us? He's here. He is. Says he's here. He's not needed, but I don't hear him. But see him. Matt, you want to take us through anything? I see you're here. Yeah, sorry. I think Josh is on. Um, he may not be uh, quite available to, to, to talk. Um, so I'll go ahead and try to. Um, answer for him. Was there a specific question, I guess, or do you just want to partake? We're just asking, Matt, if you have any additional information for us. Well, so I assume everybody reviewed the documents that we included in the report, along with Connor's, the building assessment, uh, structural report, and an estimate uh, from a previous owner, actually the previous owner, for a roof replacement. Um, essentially, in those documents, we've we've outlined all the conditions of the building as it stands. Um, you know, it's I don't know how many of you have had been in that building, uh, even recently when it was Players Pub, but it's it's in pretty bad shape. There's um, there are some structural supports that have apparently sit on no foundation. There, there are posts that are sinking into the floor. Um, while we've not done a complete structural assessment, um, it's only a visual one at this point. And then we did a, a set of drawings, uh, again, for the previous owner uh, to do a roof replacement. Essentially, he wanted to try to get it back in some type of working condition. Um, but it, the estimates were over $300,000 just to put a new roof on it. And kind of support it and make it, you know, generally functional. Uh, and that was just for the the players' pub, the one-story portion. Um, so the current, the current, current and new owner, um, Josh Alley, and his group, you know, I think when they purchased it, they understood that there are some issues. And as we've sort of looked at the building and assessed, you know, how you would how you'd renovate it, the costs involved. They just, they ended, they, they ended up back at 
you know, to, to really make any good use of this property would involve a demolition. Now, when we first re reviewed this suite, you know, we weren't really aware of any of the, I guess, historical um, significance. I, I knew that there was a Boxman's restaurant here uh, years ago. Um, I did find out about that KFC, um, but that's next door. That's not in, that wasn't in this building. Um, you know, there's no current business in here now. I think everybody know, is well aware of the, the issues that Players Pub had uh, in this space. Um, obviously, it was unfortunate. Uh, we know that there's a valuable community space here that, you know, is lost or maybe lost, um, the owner would like to do something here that would, would provide a space uh, for the community in the, in the future. We have, we've talked about some ideas of, you know, a, a commercial space that could be used for kind of indoor outdoor venues, um, live music, have, again, you know, hopefully someday again, we can go to live, live music uh, events. Um, you know, but but our initial take was if this is if this is a bit of an island of a you know quote unquote historic structure with a lot of development happening around that, that's you know favoring sorry did you lose me that's favoring you know more of a mixed use um, or going back in time <laughs> going back in time here if 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 the if the adjacent uses and development is moving toward mixed use, um, you know, development that while it takes into consideration the historic fabric um, of the streetscapes, um, that's one thing. You know, this this does have a nice streetscape with all of the you know current amenities. You can see the bike rack, the light post, wide sidewalk. Um, we'd like to take advantage of that and make use of it. Um, part of the issue is, as you can see in the front of the building, the, the floor level is about a, um, a foot or so above the sidewalk. So we've got some ADA issues. You can see that residential style ramp that was added at some point. That's actually the entrance to the, to the main floor. Um, that vestibule that's there, um, has obviously changed over time. You know, really the front of the Players Pub portion has changed quite a bit in time. Um, I've found various iterations of that facade. The, the signage portion is not, does not appear original. Um, so, you know, I, I can answer more questions and talk more about the condition of the building. And, you know, really the, the front of the building is probably the, to be honest, the nicest part. And I know that was you know, partly because of the the uh, grant funds that were used uh, to try to restore that, um, but it even even though that facade has you know a lot of issues um, a, as it stands, um, most of those you know a lot of those windows are not original. Um, so you know we're just I guess our take was where does you know where does this fit? How does this fit in to the larger picture of this? of this neighborhood and street when there's not a lot else that's, you know, that's being reused um, effectively in, in, the, in, its, in its historic condition, I guess. Um, it, you know, there may be a scenario where if we could keep some of that facade, it could be, you know, could be redeveloped, but it, it's, it's a challenge. I've I worked on other projects where we try to keep a facade or part of a facade, and you know it's it's tough. Um, but certainly, you know, if there's a scenario, we may consider it. But at this point, um, we wanted to put it out there as full demolition. Here are reasons why. Certainly, you know, as as you want to discover or uncover and do your due diligence on the building, you know, we're happy to listen and and kind of navigate through that with you. All right, thank you, Matt. Um, so Chris, questions? Yeah, so is it height that you want there that's missing if you keep the old building? Well, yeah, I mean, that's part of it is, um, 
you know, this is zoned for um, mixed use, uh, multifamily, up to 50 feet, four stories, and that's by right, not including any any of the new UDO incentives. We would be looking at um, a mixed use ground floor commercial um, up to you know within within the buy right guidelines. Um, it appears that most of the other near development is is right up that you know the chocolate moose building, uh, four stories, um, the the phase two of urban station. Um, I guess you know we can talk about pros and cons of that development, but. You know, it would be within in line of, of something like that. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Chris. Questions? That's all I got. Okay. Jeff, questions? I, I don't have any questions right now. Deb, do you have questions? Uh, not at this time, thanks. Sam? No, thank you. Duncan? Nope. Um, I do have a question, and it's concerning the uh, Players Pub side where we see the sign. Um, so you're saying that was the main floor, as I interpreted a long time ago. So you're saying there's a difference in height in the floor in there, or is it because they put the ramp in to use the other door for the handicap? Yeah, so the, the floor level is... It's, a, it's mostly the same throughout the ground floor of the building. Um, it appears that, you know, what happened was the two-story portion of this building was all residential based on older photographs. There's no commercial there at all on the ground floor. And then and they had um, individual stoops, um, nice kind of planters and landscape stoops and, uh, that went up to entries. And then the Players Pub one-story portion was commercial and had an entrance where that vestibule is. However, when you go in that vest today, there's a step up to the main level. And hence the ramp that's been added is to provide ADA access because that, they couldn't get ADA access through the, the original vestibule okay. that's there now. So inside that front door, is, there's a step up to the main level. Okay. And in the, in the report, I included some interior photographs. You can kind of see the, how that, how that works. Yeah, I've been in the building myself a few times. Um, and then, of course, the city did a bunch of work underneath the uh, north corner. Does, didn't the um, uh, water, something, water duct run through there? North corner? Right here. Where yeah, that's, cor that's correct. The, some of you may remember the, uh, the Jordan River, or whatever we're calling it now, <laughs> The, uh, the former Jordan River ran through um, a culvert below the north portion of this building. Um, and then I think four or five years ago when this, the, all the street work was done, uh, CBU um, redid the storm line and then they filled in around the storm line below the building. So there's currently about a 12 inch, looks like about a 12 inch thick concrete slab on the north end of that player's pub that that spans across that old court, but it's since been filled in. And we've been in discussion, I'd been in discussion with the city uh, utilities previously about renovating the building as it was and, you know, new structure for a, for a new roof. And they said that we, you know, we, we could probably work something out, but obviously the, the storm line has to continue. And then the the street and perhaps at the back of the property where, where it leaves the building currently. All right, thanks, Matt. Um, all right, so let's move on to comments. Chris? Yeah, I, I want to designate this building. That's my comment. All right, Chris, thank you. Jeff? Uh, I'd like to learn more about the building historically, uh, both the people in it and its purposes let alone the structure. Thank you, Deb. And uh, Jeff, uh, comments? Yeah, this building has been changed substantially. I know that there's, you know, some of it's intact. Um, this really, for me, is about context and 
really a way that that those street, streetscapes are changing along that those blocks is that it doesn't you know it, it does it's not like we're taking a tooth out of a a, a full mouth we're taking out something that sticks out now because it's way different so i would support this demolition i'm sorry say what you said there at the end i said i would support demolishing this building all right thank you sam uh, I would actually uh, second Deb's comments. I want to hear a little bit more before I would uh, pull the trigger in any direction. All right, thank you, Sam. Lee? Um, I, I do want to learn more about it. I'm, I'm kind of astonished, this is a comment, I'm kind of astonished that that's not more than one address because, I mean, we're talking alley to alley, that's one building. Everything from the Mitchell building to the next alley is uh the address um 424 and a half south walnut that's <laughs> that's pretty wild because it looks like there's several different properties there all right thank you lee uh, duncan yeah i think it's worth finding out some more about it this i you know i i know what jeff is saying about the the missing tooth thing, but I also feel like this building is, at least for me, I've been here a long time. It's kind of a placeholder on that on that what is essentially a corner. And um, I don't know. I, I've seen enough apartments; they're all bad. All right. Uh, thank you, Duncan. You know, I think this area holds a lot of memory for people. And I, I would hate to see it go away without further investigation. Um, so, if I could add one more comment. Yes, Chris. The fact that it much of the surrounding isn't very great, and now we could make another building that isn't very great, <laughs> that would be a loss, but they would be compatible. You know, this, this is 100 years, more than 100 years old, and it does hold a place and it has a character that no one will build. Planning wouldn't plan for. Only we can say, let's keep something really cool here. And that's our job to think hard about that. So I, I jumped the gun and said, I know this is where I am. I'm not playing any games. I, I think it's an important building and people love it. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think we need a motion if we want. Can I make a comment? Yeah, please. Okay, um, I, this building has been moving back towards its original for years. I mean, I remember it when it was shingled all over the front and it was not very attractive for a while. And, uh, you know, the brick has been restored and uh, you can talk about, you know, the. Yeah, I, that's a good picture right there. Uh, so it looks much better now than it did 40 years ago. Um, I can also say inside that, that weird entry there, the glass block entry, are still the original windows, the two narrow windows that were on the other side of the door. Um, those are still inside Players Pub. Uh, I, see we've lost the original windows and doors on the two-story building but that shouldn't be that hard to you know fix so you can see there's a door there it still has the overhead window there um inside the building and those the two narrower windows on either side of the door those are still there um it could be uh you know there's a weird door off to the right there that's been filled in it almost looks like you could put in a handicapped accessible place right there and that's right at floor level so to say that you know it's not handicapped accessible and it would be hard to do i don't really think it would be hard to do i really like to see um i think it's really a part of the bloomington psyche it's got a real hold on our past and I think people are gonna uh, really be annoyed about uh, and missing this place. It's, it's uh, part of the heart, a uh, little bit of soul in there <laughs> for Bloomington. So I think it should be considered very carefully before we 
uh, tear it down, uh, allow it to be torn down. Um, anyway, that was my comment. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Sorry, Miss. All right. So um, we don't we don't need any sort of official motion or anything. We have ninety days to yeah, make the decision. So that's what we will do. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll write up a report to share with you guys in your next packet. I'll outline the uh, building history and I'll really spend a lot of focus on, on the boxmans and the local significance of that restaurant. And I'll write that report and put it in your packet for the next meeting. Hey guys, this is uh, Josh Alley. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, sorry, I was having some technical difficulties. Um, does anyone know if the boxmans are still around? Um, the, the original boxmans are deceased. Um, they had children, Charlie and I can't remember the daughter's name, and I don't know if they're still alive. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Josh. Okay. Um, let's move on to new business. Naval Arts Conservation District Design Guidelines. Has everybody had a chance to review them? I have. Great, Jeff. I thought they're well done. Some of the best guidelines I've seen put together. So we have to approve these and yeah, move on with it. Okay. So um, do we have any more discussion on the guidelines? Chris? No. Deb? Nope, Sam and I helped develop them or sat in on it, so I'm, I'm certainly comfortable with them. Lee? No, they look good. All right, great. Sam? <laughs> and these are fairly in line with a lot of uh, the other guidelines, and I think they've come a long way since when we first started talking about them. Put a lot of hard work into them, Sam. They're awesome. Very well done. So can we get a uh, motion to approve? Move to approve these guidelines. I'll second. All right. D? Okay. Sam DeSoller? Yeah. Jeff Golden? Yes. Deb Hutton? Yes. Lee Sandwife? Yes. John Saunders? Yes. Chris Sturbaum? Yes. Motion carries 600. Okay, we're going to move on to old business. I know there's not anything under there, but Declan, you're still with us, right? Yes. Okay, would you talk to us about? Uh, bricks. <laughs> That's like saying, talk to you about cars. <laughs> That'd be good too. I like cars. Ask me a question. Okay, so we discussed um, a few weeks ago about uh, the city wanting to use uh, silicon or some sort of treatment uh, on the bricks of uh, the Shires building here. Uh, because they're saying that they're spalling and, and we did a straw vote and we had agreed with it. But then after looking at the building after a meeting and also learning the fact that this was a uh, afterthought, it wasn't originally uh, a part of their, their contract to, to, to treat it. And so I did talk with Duncan and um, we're not sure, or at least I don't think it's a great idea at this point. So I'm going to say I asked JD to submit a certificate of appropriateness. So it's going to be coming to you guys at the next meeting. Uh, so, you know, um, you will you can approve or deny that COA to apply this uh, sealant to the building. Um, he's consulted some more people. So he's going to arrive with his, his ammunition and his argument. Um, but I believe uh, John said he'd spoken to Duncan afterwards. And Duncan didn't buy the argument of the bricks absorbing the rain on that southern elevation is that being the root cause of their, their deterioration. I think Duncan John was asking you to speak on that. Yeah, I, um, when we did the renovation on this building, we, um, we investigated the aging, the age of the brick 
Uh, it's a 20th century product. It's a, it's a very um, um, hard, it's, it's, in other words, it's built by modern processes, which makes, makes the brick very hard. It's not comparable to handmade or hand molded bricks, which are very soft and absorbent. Even handmade bricks as they age, develop a patina that is virtually waterproof. And uh, most of the deterioration you find is in the mortar, which is lime-based and eventually can deteriorate. So it's not generally accepted, at least in preservation technology circles, that modern hard-baked kiln-developed bricks absorb water of any significant, to any ex significant dis extent except in conditions where the roof edges fail, gutters fail, windows fail, and there's a persistent amount of extra additional water that is, that is, uh, that they become, that the wall becomes subject to that, you know, beyond what it was planned to be able to take. So you see staining under windowsills, you see staining around places where there's extra water flow, sometimes around downspouts, you'll see bricks deteriorated, things like that. Those are almost always <clears throat> maintenance issues and not the, not the fault of the brick. So there are lots of buildings way older than this that are brick that don't have coatings on them that are doing just fine. So my, my and this is a prejudice and I'll, I'll just acknowledge it right, up, right off the bat, is that as technologies advance and expertise widens, although it may not get any better. Um, my experience has been that it's almost always the vendor who, are, who makes the argument for these kinds of products <laughs> and not the, not the building expert. Um, and so, and I'm not saying that I'm not wrong in this case. I'm just saying that that's been my experience. And when we worked on the showers project originally, uh, I was told by a couple of different masonry companies that we needed to retuck point 100% of the building. And I went over it with a fine tooth comb, a truck lift. I spent hours on it. I did, I did residual or I did studies of every window, uh, all this for the National Park Service in order to qualify the kinds of repairs that we would have to do to qualify for a tax credit. And there was some motor failure and there were some windows that had gone bad, and there were you know some of this and some of that. But but I would say overall the building was 80% as good as it was when it was built, and that was in 1996 or you know between 1996 and 2000 roughly. So it's hard for me personally to believe that that south wall has de has deteriorated that significantly in that relatively short period of time. I you know unless I, I just don't, I, I don't want to compare it to all the, the, the two or three of the things that we've already heard, but everybody always has a better idea for this stuff. And I, my, my teaching or my learning when I was in preservation school and also when I was teaching, I read a lot about these technologies and they come and go really quickly, but the brick seems to survive without them most of the time. Um, and now, now these products are silicone based because we have silicone. Uh, they're more breathable because we have the technology to make them more breathable, which is a good thing. Um, do they waterproof buildings in a significant way? Not that I've ever been, not that's ever been demonstrated to me because the building's already waterproof. So if, if, if somebody could give me a study and show me where water has entrained to the backside of those bricks, through the brick, I'd be the first to acknowledge it, but I've never seen a study like that. So I know I'm a, I'm a skeptical guy, but I, I just, I, I'm, I'm wary of technological fixes on things that aren't broken. Duncan, were you involved with the Johnson Creamery uh, yeah. restoration project? Yeah, I was the project manager for the owner. Did you apply uh, that, that same water sealant to the stack? No, we didn't apply any sealant to the stack. Then uh, well, I, I spoke with Keith Williams, who I think is a property manager in the building, Keith Williamson, and he told me that 
water sealant had been applied to the stack, and I was kind of shocked to, to hear that. I'm not, I can't argue whether it has since then or not, but we didn't do it in our renovation in 95. Okay. Now that's a little bit different problem because when you have a, when you have a, a, a terracotta tile with a glaze on it, um, if the glazes break down, the matrix is, is much softer. And, and also stacks are eaten from the inside out by sulfur dioxide. From burning coal, and and so the, so you have a and, and brick is very sensitive to coal burning, and so you have an as, an acid that's eating the tower from the inside out, and that's usually what they want to do is parge the inside with another coating, usually a masonry or plaster type coating, and that's I I think that's warranted in many many cases for structural stability, but but in it but it's not the same problem. <laughs> And on the broom, on the on the broom, on the creamery itself, we didn't put any coating on that brick. That's a 1913 building. It's just as old. Did you see that the state did a Duncan, did, yeah. did you look at the south wall of the showers? Well, I walked mm -hmm. by there after I heard about this. After I got the phone call, I didn't get up on a ladder, you know. So I I I, I didn't I couldn't get a microscopic look at it. Right. But I don't know what they're. I can't see what they're talking about. So you didn't see the the deterioration that they're describing there is there is some but uh, you know that's aging <laughs> and even then even a crack in a brick rarely allows water to penetrate very deeply because as soon as the water hits it it, it fills the crack so it's you know I, i'm not saying it never does but i usually you see interior deterioration when water is penetrating a wall Okay, so you'll see, you'll see uh, acid rain streaks, you see lime deposits, you see efflorescence, which is this deposit of salt through evaporation. And I, I went into the lobby and walked around and in there, I didn't, on the south side, and I didn't see any of that either in the city hall side or the um, cook side. Hey Duncan, could it come from inside out with a humidity issue? Or is that brick just too impervious? There is always an exchange of temperature when there's a temperature gradient variant because pressure it, it it pressures change, and so when you have a heated space against a cold exterior wall, the pressure is to push the heat to the outside, and and vice versa when you have, a, you know, a, a a warmer wall on the outside and, and air conditioning on the inside, it wants to push moisture through the wall the other way. But that's a pretty thick wall. <laughs> so, uh, and if it were handmade brick or soft brick like the house that I live in, I, you see rising damp and you see, you see those exchanges from pressure pretty commonly. And they're very, very difficult to cure. Um, but that's groundwater rising up into the building. Right. His argument will be that it's spalling mostly on that side. Well, that's a, that's a weather exposed side. Right. But I'm not, but does a, is a sealer the, the solution? That's, that's the question. Yeah. And I, I don't think historically it's been demonstrated that it is. But, you know, on, I'm, I'm trying to be just as honest as I can with you guys, because I don't really know if these guys are right or not. I just know from what I've read and what I've studied and the, the historic preservation specialties information that I've read, uh, often contradicts what the Masons or the vendor is telling you. <laughs> so I, yeah, I can't, I can't really say, you know, that's why I say I, I, I come off as just being skeptical and I, you know, but I, I've had several people offer to put some coating like that on my house and I just walk away from them. You know? have, have you heard a downside in, in your readings of, of putting this kind of thing on old brick like that? The, the downside can be that it traps moisture in the wall when you want the wall to breathe. And so there are there are coefficients of breathability, you know, there there are you can you can see studies that show that show that these some of these coatings are so called breathable and and now they make breathable paint as well for for masonry surfaces that are badly deteriorated and they they are pretty effective. Uh, the um, the um, Paris Dunning house has has been painted for a long time, and and we when we when we worked on that house, 
we were told historically that the brick was really starting to deteriorate. Now that's older, not factory made, not hard brick, but that 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 the paint was um, was what you know was really helping the house. And we took samples of it, and it was a breathable paint. And the house, we put another coat on. <laughs> so I'm not against using these things in some cases, but on a modern brick, it's it's typically not warranted. I'd, I'd be interested, I would like to be the fly on the wall in the conversation that generated it, this, this, this suggestion. Is this something that the, that the vendor or the, that the Masons are suggesting? Because if it's coming from the vendor, it needs to come from more expertise, I think, than that. Duncan, that's, that's, what, I was, that's what we were arguing the last time when we spoke with them. You know, it, it's coming, you're right, it's coming straight from the vendor. They're saying the seal needs to be applied. You know, and I said that what should have happened is we had an independent historic masonry expert evaluated, creating a, a report. And if that report said that sealant was needed to fix an issue on the south wall, then there wouldn't be an issue here. But that's not the chain of events. And that's why, um, you know, I thought this whole thing was a little strange and we brought it before you. So that hasn't happened. It did come. Yeah. And, I, and there are, there are, you know, I'm not in the business anymore and I'm not putting my, I don't want to be hired to do this job. I, I honestly don't. But, but there are people who will. <laughs> You know, there are consultants who, who are experts in this. I've studied with them. And so it is, that information it could be gotten if either, either the city wants to pay for it or, you know, but, to, but, you know, well, I've said what I said about, you know, taking the vendor's advice. I don't know. I, I'm skeptical. All right. But if, if you really want to do it right, then the city needs to hire a consultant who's independent. Yeah, exactly. Um, anybody else got some questions for Duncan? Sam? Jimmy? No question. Okay. All right. Well, let's move on. I'd like to. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. I'd like to comment on the. Uh... Um, okay, so I don't. My. My. Uh, my cast is a little glitchy here, so hopefully you'll be able to hear me. Um, my, we studied this a lot when we were doing the guidelines, uh, whether or not we should allow sealed stone and stuff. So I actually read a lot on these. Um, and also I, I picked that subject in the guidelines because we have a, a brick fireplace and it had whole front faces of the bricks popping off at that time and they hadn't ever before. Um, so we did two different things and of course we assumed it was water coming up from the ground and it wasn't and it wasn't water coming in from the outside that was damaging the brick. Um, we did two things. One was we had the whole fireplace re pointed and the seal worked on around the roof where it cuts into the brick and we put a top on our chimney so it couldn't go if it was coming in the inside and then going out pulling out through the brick at that level uh, it would also stop that now i'm not sure which one of those things worked we did those three things and we absolutely have had no trouble at all with any spalling again and we were also suggested oh well you could seal it and you know that's why i was doing so much research uh, online about sealers uh, supposedly, they have breathable sealers now, um, but since this particular has both retuck pointed, it resealed the windows, and you know supposedly the roof and stuff is good, then it could be that the trouble is done and nothing else needs to be done. Um, so that's going to be my only comment on that. So um, that's it. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, this this is Duncan again. Uh, I, I think that I think that Jenny's making a really good point that usually it, it's not that water can't get into brick and it's not that faces can't blow off from freeze thaw, but almost always the water's coming from somewhere else. It's coming through the roof or around the windows or so so I, I would agree with her. The work they've done should be adequate. Good. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Duncan, for talking to us about it tonight. And that'll help us at our next meeting. Okay, commissioner comments? All right, hearing none. 
Uh, do we have some public comments? Do we still have people with us? Probably not. <laughs> okay. Do we have any announcements? All right. Um, can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay. <laughs> All right, our meeting's adjourned. We'll yes. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye.